All right. Are we good? All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Jason Schmidt. I'm the district attorney here in Chautauqua County. I'm joined up here with the Honorable James P. Uh, Kennedy, Jr., our uh, United States Attorney here in the Western District of New York, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney David Rudolph, Rudolph <clears throat> uh, Lieutenant Frank Vitko, Senior Investigator Joe Smith, and Investigator Paul Landwehr, who are with the New York State Police, <clears throat> Trooper Jim O'Callaghan, who's also with the New York State Police, um, Assistant Special Agent in Charge Mark Lamont with the Department of Homeland Security. I've got uh, Beth Oaks and, and Carrie Lee who are with me. They're both with the Child Advocacy Center here in Chautauqua County. Beth is the Executive Director and Carrie Lee is the Ad Director of Advocacy. Or, okay. Advocacy Coordinator. Advocacy Coordinator, excuse me. I also have First Assistant Tracy Brunez and I have uh, Shannon Friends. She's the Director of our Victims Assistance Center here in Chautauqua County DA's office. My mission in coming on board here in Chautauqua County as the district attorney was to put victims first in our prosecutorial decisions and hold people accountable when they harm others. Where there's evidence of a crime, the goal here is to aggressively fight for the victims of those crimes. No segment of our community is more precious to us and more vulnerable to those who prey on the weak as children. We as a society are responsible for protecting our children who oftentimes are defenseless and most at risk of being abused. Ideally, we would achieve this preventatively before crimes against children take place, but that generally doesn't happen. It therefore falls on police and prosecutors to ensure that justice is served, that those who prey on the weak are held to answer for their crimes. With that, this morning, the Chautauqua County Court unsealed a 24-count indictment against Dustin Post of Silver Creek, New York, age 25, charging Mr. Post with, among other crimes against children, 11 separate crimes of predatory sexual assault against a child, each a Class A2 violent felony, nine separate crimes of criminal sexual act in the first degree, each a Class B violent felony, and rape in the first degree, also a Class B violent felony. The crimes described in the indictment are alleged to have been committed against seven different children here in Chautauqua County, the oldest being 12 years old, the youngest being one. They span the period between in or around September of 2015 through August of 2019. Under our law, Mr. Post is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Mr. Post was arraigned on these charges this morning by our Honorable uh, David, our, I'm sorry, our County Court Judge, the Honorable David Foley, who entered a plea of not guilty on Mr. Post's behalf. Judge Foley then set bail at $1 million cash, $2 million real property. Mr. Post is currently incarcerated on federal charges of production and possession of child pornography. Those charges were brought by Mr. Kennedy in his office in the Federal District Court for the Western District of New York. This past Monday, Mr. Post pled guilty to two, two counts of production of child pornography and three counts of possession of child pornography. <clears throat> He's scheduled to be sentenced on October 1st, and Mr. Kennedy will be speaking about that case shortly. The state charges unsealed this morning are a separate matter, altogether from Mr. Kennedy's case, and any sentence that Mr. Post receives as a result of this prosecution will likely run consecutive to whatever happens to him in federal court. On our charges, Mr. Post is facing imprisonment for the rest of his life. The sentencing range in each count of predatory sexual assault of a child is an indeterminate period of incarceration in state prison for not less than 10 years to life, nor more than 25 years to life. We are now on the trial track in that case. The next event in the case is a discovery conference which the court has scheduled for June 28th Barring any defense requests, I anticipate the case being calendared for trial sometime approximately six months from now, although there may be scheduling delays due to the backlog of cases being adjudicated now that our county court has been cleared to conduct trials. This prosecution follows a lengthy investigation conducted by Homeland Security, the State Police's Bureau of Criminal 
investigations together with my office and the Chautauqua County Child Advocacy Program. Now, for those who are not familiar, familiar with the Child Advocacy Program, they are an important partner in the investigation of child physical and sexual abuse. Each of the people here with me today and their respective colleagues have been instrumental in working hard to bring these cases forward. State Police Investigator Paul Landwehr, in particular, should be singled out for his tireless efforts. So too should First Assistant Tracy Brunes. Together we'll try to answer any questions you may have. Uh, keep in mind that the state charges were just laid and the investigation is ongoing, so we may not be able to answer many of your questions relative to that. We do not want to say anything which will compromise the integrity of our case. I want to applaud the bravery of child victims and their families who come forward to tell their stories. No one wants to relive traumatic events. They do so in order that others do not experience what they have. As a final remark, these are the victims that we know about. There may be others, and I want to encourage anyone with information relative to this case to contact my office, and I'll give you the number. It's 716-753-4241. Uh, As I said, this is an ongoing investigation. Uh, for the reason that there may be other victims out there, we, we have included in the press packets a picture of, uh, of Mr. Post. With that, I will now turn it over to the United States uh, Attorney, uh, James P. Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, very much. And thank you for having us down in beautiful Chautauqua County. I wish it were under better circumstances that we we're here today, but um, Chautauqua County, as you all know, is one of the 17 districts covered within the Western District of New York. And as, as you also know, 85% of law enforcement in the United States is done at the state and local level. And this case, I think, shows uh, what a coordinated effort can bring where um, the federal government working with our federal partners, in this case, HSI, and under the uh, stewardship of Assistant United States Attorney David Rudroff, worked with the state police, with the district attorney's office, uh, with uh, the Child Advocacy Center here in Chautauqua County and with others to bring um, to justice someone that was very much in need of receiving some justice. In November of 2019, the New York State Police received a walking complaint from the mother of an eight-year-old little girl that had disclosed that she had been sexually abused by this defendant, uh, Mr. Post, uh, in the summer of 2018. Two days later, that child was forensically interviewed at the Child Advocacy Center here in Chautauqua County, and she disclosed the sexual abuse that she discovered it, or that she endured at the hands of the, this defendant. Thereafter, state police investigators, together with uh, special agents of the Homeland Security Invest uh, Investigation Unit, represented here today by Assistant Special Agent in Charge Mark Lamont and led by uh, Special Agent in Charge Kevin Kelly, who's out of town right now. Uh, those state police investigators and special agents interviewed uh, the defendant, 25-year-old uh, Dustin Post. And based upon that interview, uh, they conducted some additional investigation. It was determined that the defendant had sexually abused, in many instances, raped a number of young children. The defendant's cell phone, four thumb drives, as well as a laptop laptop computer were also seized and examined. And in February of 2020, the defendant was charged in a five count indictment with two counts of production of child pornography uh, and three counts of possession of child pornography based upon the forensic review of those items I mentioned. The production of child pornography charges because of uh, the defendant's criminal history carry with them a mandatory minimum term of imprisonment of 25 years and a maximum of 50 years on each count of conviction, as do the three child possession counts carry uh, mandatory sentences of between 10 and, tw or excuse me, discretionary sentences of between 10 and 20 years. Now the two production counts uh, of which the defendant has now been convicted in federal court 
relate to videos which were found on those devices uh, that the defendant actually produced. He actually produced the videos that were contained on those devices and both of them relate to an incident which occurred in the summer of 2019 involving a 12 year old girl that the defendant was babysitting. The defendant told that this young girl that his own two year old son had been kidnapped and that the kidnappers were demanding that this defendant send him a video of the young girl performing oral sex on him so that his son might be released. That of course was not true um, but as a result of that conduct, the defendant produced two different videos which represent the two counts of production of which the defendant has been convicted of uh, him forcibly raping this child orally. Um, um, very, very, very disturbing. And the remaining counts pertain to the literally hundreds of videos and photographs of child pornography which were found on the electronic devices recovered from the defendant some of which include toddlers and sadomasochistic uh, activity. As I said, this past Monday on May 24th, the defendant appeared in federal court before uh, United States District Judge Lawrence Villardo and pled guilty to all five counts of the indictment against him. There was no plea agreement. There was no plea bargain. He pled guilty to everything. And um, he is scheduled, as the district attorney mentioned, to be sentenced on October 1st before Judge Villardo. I think this case highlights sort of the, the, the force multiplier that can come when federal, state, and local authorities work together. Throughout the pandemic, my office, uh, the Western District of New York, we've been the only U.S. Attorney's Office in the entire Second Circuit to keep our grand jury operating throughout the pandemic. And it's a credit to the men and women of my office, uh, as well as to the judges in our district, that we were able to accomplish this and as a result, able to continue to try to achieve justice uh, for victims, as Jason said, who are really why we do what we do. So I really want to commend um, HSI, our federal partners, state police, Chautauqua County District Attorney's Office, Chautauqua County Advocacy Center for the tremendous work in this case. Um, as we'll see what he gets sentenced to, but he's facing over, well over 100 years in federal court. And that, as um, um, the district attorney said, could be uh, potentially uh, any sentence he receives uh, in the event of conviction here in state court could be imposed consecutively to that. Yes, uh, serious, serious charges indeed, but cer certainly worthy of the effort that was put forth here. And as um, the district attorney mentioned too, um, if there are any other victims of uh, this defendant, uh, we'd ask that they please come forward. Um, but uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the district attorney. Thank you all for coming here today. And as I indicated, uh, we're, we have to be careful in how we answer questions because we have an ongoing case, but uh, we'll open it up if anyone has any questions. Can you disclose the address of the Just uh, Silver Creek, New York. Just Silver Creek. Yes, ma'am. There's a question. I can tell you that in, in federal court, the criminal complaint alleges that the defendant lived at an address in Fredonia, which was where he was at the time uh, when he was arrested uh, by the federal authorities and the state police down there. So, and then as to his location in Silver Creek, I'm just not sure. I can't address that. That was in Fredonia. Yes. Were all the victims from the North County area, were any from the South County? Well, I can only address, as to the, the one victim, which is the basis for the federal charges of which he's been convicted, we've just disclosed sort of where that happened, but I can't address anything with the state charge. In our case, they're all North County victims that we're aware of. Why 
authorities didn't act upon arresting him at that moment in time because the tip first came in in 2018 and according to the DOJ's release there was another instance of abuse in 2019 uh, obviously it looked like this guy was on people's radar I, I don't want to speak too too much to that because some of this was a pending this was a pending investigation and still is a pending investigation with New York State Police. I can tell you that when we when this office got involved when I took you know I, I took over here as DA in January we met with BCI and New York State Police and that was something that they had brought to our attention that was was an investigation and then uh, uh, tr actually Tracy Brunez then t uh, took it over and and. From that point forward, we, we were in grand jury. How did he get access to these children? Sure. He had access to these children by befriending the children's uh, mothers or other caregivers. Um, so these are children that were known to him, but unbeknownst to the parents or the caregivers. Uh, they did not know uh, what had been going on with Mr. Post. Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y, Brunez, B-R-U-N-E-C-Z. He actually is in primary federal custody, so he and he will remain there throughout the pendency of these things. And follow up to that question for the DA. Uh, knowing that he is in jail right now while this state investigation is going on, how much of a sense of relief is there knowing that he wouldn't be able to abuse any more children now that he's behind bars and he can continue this investigation? Absolutely. It gives us a chance to pause, determine the extent of the damage that's been caused by this individual investigate the matter further and bring any further charges that may come to light through our investigation. What's, uh, what's being done for the victims right now? And I know the child advocacy folks are here. Uh, has this been an ongoing situation or children in therapy or what's being done for them? On behalf of Ms. Oaks, uh, I'll answer that question. The child advocacy uh, program is very involved with these children uh, and their parents. There is ongoing counseling and other services made available to them. There are several uh, advocates in the child advocacy program who are working with these children. And I cannot say enough as to the good work they are doing with our victims. Well, it's, you know, it's, you've got children who were traumatized by this. And you've got families that were traumatized. And to have to relive these events for, for them is just, it's just such a difficult, uh, it's, it's just such a difficult uh, endeavor. And, and there, there's an ongoing healing process. And, and that's something that I think, you know, our, our victims advocates can, can speak to better than I can. But Certainly part of this is, is to, you know, in, in, in any, and, I, and I'd rather talk more generally than specific to this case because I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to affect the integrity of the prosecution, but generally speaking to, to, to where we're always concerned about empowering our victims and, and giving them a voice to be heard here. We haven't uh, pushed them to go forward, we, we want them to make that decision, and that's a very personal decision, I think, and that's not something that comes lightly in each case they're dealt with differently, and, and it's something that we're very sensitive to. And I will say that, uh, and again, I'm speaking very generally, when, when a decision is made to go forward with a prosecution, the last thing that we want to do is, is re-victimize you know, our victims. And so we're very sensitive to that. We're very sensitive to making sure that we have enough evidence to go forward, that we can cross the finish line. And uh, we do a lot of hand-holding uh, through our partners here in order to, to make sure that we do this together. Are the 24 counts, um, what are federal or state? 
the, the, the indictment that was just unsealed, these are all uh, state charges under our New York penal law. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the unsealed indictment uh, that was uh, that, on which Mr. Post was arraigned this morning. Uh, these are all state charges. On Monday, Mr. Post pled guilty to a five-count indictment that was filed in the federal court in Buffalo, the Western District of, of New York, and that was uh, prosecuted by Mr. Kennedy and his office. And if I could just go back to that question about the victims, too. I, I, I want to echo the district attorney's sentiments about, um, you know, the concern that we have in dealing with these cases specifically and federally, as, as you surmised from the charges that I described today, oftentimes what gives us jurisdiction to these sorts of crimes are the use of the Internet. And, you know, I think one thing that's often overlooked is that um, every time those images are viewed and disseminated, children are re-victimized. And I think that it's, um, you know, why, you know, we pursue so vigorously these sorts of charges because we that's always in our mind when someone looks at these images each time that happens these children get re-victimized and have to relive basically the worst day of their lives when they were raped and abused uh, by an adult and so that's why you know we bring so many of these cases that's you know i think it, it is very much a victim centric uh, these are victim centric prosecutions one in which we really rely upon our uh, county and local child advocacy centers as we have, you know, in this case with the Chautauqua County. They're the professionals. They know how to, you know, um, offer some assistance to these kids. And, you know, that's the primary concern that we have. Um, yes, protecting future kids, um, but, uh, you know, a huge concern and not to be overlooked is, um, you know, it's just a picture. It's not just a picture. It's a victim, and we'll, we'll never forget that. So just wanted to add that. How far did these pictures go? I mean, and how much of his motivation was to get them far and wide? Or, you know, can you give a perspective of just how aggressive he was in sharing? Well, certainly I can tell you that he had a number of images on the devices, videos and still images on the devices that he had much of which are available online. And, and again, speaking sort of generally, um, that's the way these people work, is they trade. They file share, they, you know, whatever it might be, there's different applications that they use um, because there's this sort of never uh, satisfied desire for more, <coughs> for more disgusting images and things like that. So. That's you know why when we have a production case as we did here, you know we we bring every charge that we can basically think of um, because we want to prevent that behavior from occurring. Prevent because once it's out there in you know the internet, it's, it's sort of there forever. And uh, you know we'd certainly work at the federal level with um, our service <laughs> providers, you know, with different internet search companies to try and you know, scrub these things and get these things off, but it's, it's you know, putting the toothpaste back in the tube and it's very difficult to do. And so um, that's why when we, when we get somebody that's actually producing, as this defendant has been convicted of federal court of doing now, um, we respond so aggressively. Yeah, as, as I indicated, the, the state's case is now on the trial track. Uh, we've got a uh, discovery conference that's scheduled for June, June 28th. Uh, we've already uh, uh, begun the process of, of, of uh, complying with the, the new discovery laws under our, our criminal procedure laws. Uh, at that point, uh, there will be an opportunity for the defense to file motions. Those motions will be dealt with by, by my office, and the judge uh, will, will then hold any hearings that he feels are, are, are appropriate, and at that point, the case will be uh, calendared for trial. Uh, The answer is the answer is yes. We are always investigating uh, these cases, and unfortunately, they, they come up. 
more often than not, I, I think New York State Police can, the BCI and Homeland Security can speak to that better than I can if, if, if you want to. Uh, Real quickly. Um, so, uh, Mark Lamont with Homeland Security Investigation. So, it, it is a, a virtual pandemic, I mean, to coin the word, that has real tangible uh, physical, you know, consequences on, on individuals. Um, I have a group that investigates it. We, we work hand in hand with the state police as we did in this case. And I could probably use two groups or three groups just in Western New York alone uh, to investigate it. So it, it really is, is a pandemic. It's more pervasive than, than you would think um, it is. Um, you know, so when we do get these cases, we make sure that we try to either get them to uh, the state DA or to the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute. I don't remember who exactly said it, but uh, someone had mentioned that Mr. Post had uh, befriended the mother of the victims beforehand. Uh, I'm just curious to know if there's any, for anybody listening or watching this, if there's any warning signs that they should see if they take what happened with Mr. Post apply to their situation, because obviously we don't want something like this to happen again. What are the warning signs and potential predators that people should have? watch out for? Unfortunately, there are very few warning signs in these type of cases. Uh, these individuals uh, know what they're doing. They know that it has to be in secret. And they have a way, in, in our terminology, they groom the victim. Um, and they make it appear as though they are the nicest guy in the world. And probably in... 98% of the cases, the victim and the parents of the victim are taken unaware. I wish I could say there was a set of warning signs that we could make people aware of, but there really isn't. And if I can just follow up on that, my advice though is to have make sure that parents are talking to their kids. And um, they, that's the thing, these people find a way to get access to kids. And um, I think that it's incumbent upon parents uh, to listen to their children, uh, to have conversations with their children, um, and to trust their instincts. Um, you know, if, if a person is trying to get access to your kids, think twice. It's, we see it all the time, school teachers, coaches, um, you know, other, other individuals, babysitters, people that have access to children. And that's, that's why they have access, because they want to commit these crimes. And so um, parents need to be um, vigilant in, in, in communicating with their kids and talking to their kids and ensuring that, um, you know, they have uh, a good knowledge of what's actually going on when they're not around. Jason, does uh, Mr. Post have legal representation? I, I, Public defenders. Yeah. Yes. Stockwood County Public Defender's Office at this point. Any further questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for Thank you so much. Good job. Hard work. Of course. Yeah.